Welcome to the Trellix Spotlight Series. My name is Nick, and I will be your host. Today's session will focus on best practices for ENS for Mac. This webinar will be recorded. If you prefer not to participate in the recorded session, please feel free to disconnect at this time. A link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. This webinar is a brief overview covering common use cases and scenarios regarding this topic. It is not intended to be all-encompassing. If assistance is needed, please contact Trellix Technical Support. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A window. This webinar may run longer or shorter based on your participation, and we recommend asking as many questions as you can to make the most of this time. If the Q&A window is not displayed, click the tab at the bottom of your session window and click on the Q&A icon. We will answer the questions during the final section of this webinar. If you experience any audio issues during the webcast, please drop and attempt to reconnect. Our speakers today are Guru Raj MD and Hitesh Reddy. Guru Raj works as a technical support engineer with expertise in McAfee Enterprise Mac and Linux products over 10 years with the company. He currently delivers advanced support for all Mac and Linux endpoint products globally. Hitesh has over three years of experience with McAfee products. He specializes in supporting non-Windows platforms and is currently providing stand-in advanced support for all Mac and Linux endpoint products. Ladies and gentlemen, Hitesh and Guru. Thank you, Nick. Hi, everyone, and thank you all for joining today's session. My name is Hitesh, along with my colleague, Guru. We shall quickly go to our agenda today. We will start with understanding GAP and its purpose, exclusion for endpoint security Mac, further moving to firewall debug logging and analysis, and conclude with Web Control for Mac. Moving to our first topic, what is Jamf? As most of us know, Jamf is an MDM solution used in a comprehensive management system, specifically for Apple, Mac OS, and iOS devices. Some of the features of Jamf, device and application management, identity and access management, security and privacy. With Jamf, an IT administrator can proactively manage the entire life cycle of Apple devices, which includes deploying and maintaining the software, responding to the security threat, and analyzing the inventory data. One of the major functionality used in installing endpoint security for Mac is elevating the use of Jamf on automating the manual authentication and user consent. Now with the usage of Jamf in endpoint security Mac. Starting from Mojave 10.14, Apple introduces a feature called Privacy Policy to Sense Control, which requires end users consent to allow any third-party application installed to have access to the protected system location like removal storage devices, network shares, etc. Due to this, Trellix comes up with a predefined profile listed in the KBA 91109 that specifies the binary that threat prevention should comply with the PPPC feature of Apple. System extension policy control and content filter service. Product that use a network extension starting from Catalina to Monterey requires end user consent to load any third party system extension and also use network system extension for network events. Hence, profile listed in the KBA 93600 will allow in automating the required approval before firewall can protect the system. Using these profile configured on Jamf, administrator would eliminate the manual process that can extend on individual Mac machine in the infrastructure. End of the year. Let's move to see this in action. Now, let's understand what Jamf here on a basic level. As I said, Jamf is a major MDM, mobile device management across Apple softwares and Apple applications overall. Let's understand a few brief introduction of Jamf and how the dashboard looks like and few other details before we move on to the configuration of profiles. Now, this is how the dashboard looks like and there are major features that you can see is inventory, content management, groups and enrollment. I will go through individual, which is something that we could relate to our endpoint security deployment. So under computers, you should be and you would be able to understand list of Apple machines that we are using to configure the profiles. Now, let me take in one example machine for us here. And let me show how the profile and how the computer details looks like. And this would act like an orchestrator again, 
where in every detail about that Mac machine is captured here, be it a desktop, be it a laptop. Now under general, what can I see? I can start from understanding the host name of the machine to the understanding of the user account that is there and also a few other capabilities from the hardware perspective. Moving on to more details on the hardware, you will see the individual details of the model of the Apple machine, including with the uh, uh, the uh, configuration of the memory and a lot more other details. As you can see, this is an example of a MacBook Pro 13.2 with x86 architecture, which is an Intel chipset, followed by four gigs of total memory allocated for this ma machine. Now, moving on to software, we can understand a little more about the operating system. So this Apple machine is running with Mac OS 12.0.1, which is Monterey, and also a connection with the actor directly would also be configured here. Now, these are the basic details that I can fetch from Jamf about individual Mac machine. Now, one of the major detail is under applications, where every application that is installed, which is an inbuilt, which is also uh, includes with the user defined products. Any third party application that can be used will all be listed here for a inventory purpose. Now moving on to the major aspect profiles. This is a location where you can see and number of profiles loaded to an individual machine. As you can see, these are the default profiles. Once the machine is communicating to jam profile, there are certain profiles that is preloaded. Based on this is where we can add up the profiles individually for respective application. This further extends to understand the user local accounts where number of user accounts created starting from the local admin account to an individual active directory account, everything would be documented here. Now, this would be the inventory of a Mac machine here. Now, moving on to profiles here. When we go to configuration profile, you would see all the profiles not only has to be with anything that is related to endpoint security or Trellix application. This can was run out with any third party vendors, OEM vendors having their, having their profiles. Now let's understand how do I load the profile. Now before I load, let's go to our dedicated article which explains how do I activate manually load or load with the predefined configuration. Now, as I explained a little more about PPPC, the same details is also documented in my article. Now, coming to the configuration here, you would see a list of details here with the process path and the bundle ID and how do I configure this? I was starting from uh, Mojave where these details started. We used to individually add these uh, process path is then where Jamf came into picture and understanding of much better configuration that we can play in. As you can see on the matrix table here, there are certain process path which is mandatory on all ENS inversion, and there are certain process path that is dedicatedly should be used to specific ENS inversion. Starting with FMPD and VShield scanner is a common process path across all ENS inversion. If I see here with 10.6.5 to 10.6.7, VShield services and is an additional. Starting from 10.7.5 and later, this is a bundle ID of endpoint security, which is actually gonna be used across uh, endpoint security for Mac, EDR for Mac, and also somewhere in the DLP perspective as well. Now, this is where an individual can configure it manually on a jam profile. If not, all we have to do is to go through the bottom of it. You will see a predefined configuration of the services that we provide. All we have to do is to download and check in there. Let's go with the profile uploading as well. Now I've downloaded this. Let me quickly go in and extract it as well. Once I extract, you would actually see the profile details here too, which is this. Now, how do I upload it? Very simple again. 
I'll click on upload here, select the file, and that's it. Now, once uploaded, you would be also seeing the configuration here. Now, as you can see, few details that we will have to understand. With the naming convention, I can change it to anything. For now, I'll purposely make it to test for our understanding. And site, I can decide it with the different site that I have predefined on the Jamf console. A difference would be there from machine to or machine organization to organization, anything that we work on with. Now, where do I apply? Is it going to be at a computer level or a user defined level? That also configures here where I can apply it to specific user levels or it has to be at a computer level. Now, every profile I load would have two method of distribution. One is where it will instantly automatically load once the machine communicates and registered with Jamf, or I can make the profile available in the services where I can choose individually. Now again, I can mark it to install automatically or make it available in the self services. Now, once I make it available in the self services, it adds up another feature or I would say another platform where the end users can have the option to remove it or uh, retain it. Usually this wouldn't be recommended because of certain criteria that has to be followed. It's set to default as no, we can change it to S if needed. And next, let's see the configuration that we modified here while loading. And you will see that under PPVC here. Now this would load every configuration or process path that is listed here. For basic very good reason, I don't want uh, a customer using 10.6.7 to miss out a specific path where he upgrades to 10.7.5 because each individual endpoint security version would need certain process path here, which is why we have loaded every process path that is listed along with one bundle ID, which is endpoint security along with the bundle ID. So every application and every details is already loaded here. With this said, this will allow me to have it starting to a configuration from 10.6.5 series to 10.7.8 series with one single profile. Once we are confirmed with this, all we have to do is to save it up. And the profile is saved with the name PPPC test. Now, how do I search this up? All I have to do is to use this word test and you will see a list of application or a list of profiles that's going to show up. And here we go, the one which we have shared. But did I configure it to targeted machine? No. Now let's move on to aligning a machine here to understand how do I configure it or how do I load it? Once I have the profile here, all I have to do is to click on edit. Go back to scope here. And I can target the machine here. Once again, specific users or specific computers are all computers. How do I search it? All we have to do is to click on add and you will see the list of machines already throwing up here. All I have to do is to select one and add. Once that is done, click on save. This profile will be now pushed to this specific targeted machine. Now, this is what we can do it on individual other profiles that we have for PPPC, SCPC, and also CFS. The procedure would be very much similar. Nothing would change on that aspect. And once done, you are good on the loading of a profile. Now, this is done on the profile side. Now, in order to have this profile loaded, in order to need this machine to see it on the Jamf, Jamf end, what should I do it on the client machine? I have to first register that and make sure it is communicating to Jamf server. Now let's also look into that aspect. Now here I'll move on to a machine where I can start with a configuration for us. How do I register that? I'll have to first enroll it. Now, how do I enroll it? I would always given me a login credentials detail for the Jamf cloud. All I have to do is to log in. 
once logged in, I will start enrolling it. Now I'll click on enroll. It will start downloading a, a configuration profile here. Being Chrome, it will give me a prompt to keep it, allow it. I can select that. And once it is done, all I have to do is to double click on the config profile. And right after that, you will see the profiles opening up here under settings, system preferences again. Now with this, you can see the icon of profiles showing up here and it is waiting for my authentication to install. I'll go ahead and install. Once it's installed, it's confirmed and verified. Now, this is not all. This is just on the registration part. We will have to enroll it as a MDM profile. Once again, download that MDM profile. Just double click on it. And right after that, you will see the MDM profile showing up here. Now while installing this, the operating system will prompt an authentication requirement for the end user to allow it. Let me just go ahead and allow this. Once loaded, it starts loading the installation and the registration. Right after that, you did see the enrollment process is complete. Now, this usually will take around five to 10 minutes time or a reboot of the machine to synchronize with every profile that is loaded specific to the machine. Now, with the interest of time, I do have an active machine where the profiles are loaded and we can plan on understanding how do I install. Now, I kept repeating the prompts. I kept repeating the user con consent, what is needed. Now, first, let's compare what is a user concern that I have to go through as an individual user compared to a profile that is already loaded on the jump? Now I have a dedicated machine here with considered to be a standalone machine without an enrollment on jump and I've installed my software here with endpoint security map and let me walk you through the prompts that I would see. Right after the installation, we would see the prompt here. This is a very much common prompt. Any third party application that I'm installing and Mac OS would need that authentication to done. So as you can see the alert that's coming from McAfee, though it's triggered at a OS level, it's reporting uh, extension that is being blocked or a McAfee software that is being blocked, which have to be authenticating manually. Along with that, I have certain preferences which we spoke about PPPC because of threat prevention and ATP. These full disk access for these process paths are needed. Now, how do I enable it? I have to still again go back to under system preferences. And you can see under general, I have to go back and allow this. And also starting from uh, with the threat prevention, I have to go to full disk access and start authenticating FMPD, VShield Scanner, and also VShield Scan Manager. Now, this is on the threat prevention and ATP side. Now, imagine I also have firewall installed. That is where it comes with the content filtering as well. Now, imagine I start with enabling firewall. You will see the very first prompt to allow this with the SCPC and then I start to allow it on. You will again see a, cons a consent that is about content filter. Again, I'll have to get it allowed. Then is when the firewall module is ready and can start protecting it. Now usage of Jamf here specifically for endpoint security is all over about eliminating these process. Now that said, we will move on to a machine which has the jump loaded and everything ready for us. Now this is an example machine I have which has all the profiles that I need to have the installation without any user consent required. Now I have PPPC here which is loading all the process path. I have SCPC here which is rolling with the consent and also CFS which is specifically for firewall. Now this said, the profiles are loaded in the backend. Let me get start away with installing the endpoint security. Now I'm using a standalone here to understand the prompts that we could see and how would I eliminate that?
Let's continue with the installation. Accept with the user agreement. And I am selecting all the modules just for our understanding here and proceed with the installation. And this prompt that you would see is a common prompt that you would see for every installation of products. The installation would usually take two to three minutes of it. Once done, you would see the changes altogether. While this is going, let me also add up a point here. Uh, we do have this con uh, concept about loading the PPPC details of process path of FMPD, VShield Scanner and VShield Scan Manager. Those should be always added, not only added, but also checked in under security and preferences, which will allow the authentication. Whereas compared to Jamf, we don't have to even do that. It's actually loaded in the backend itself which I will show you now. Now the installation is completed and I have not seen any prompt here. Let me quickly go back. Compared to the previous machine that I showed, it was in Amber where the machine is not protected and the machine is not enabled with threat prevention and firewall. Now you can see I have no concern, no prompts, no authentication required. The threat prevention is loaded, enabled and perfectly working as well which is where Jamf will play a high vital role here. Now that said, I spoke about a very minor thing, but also a very important thing here. And the security and preferences, we went on the previous detail where we started to see certain process path that needed to be accepted here. As you can see now, Visual Scan Manager is not checked, but uh, not even loaded, but also not checked. And you don't even see FMPD or Visual Scanner or Visual Scan Manager. However, everything perfectly works fine. You could question me back asking how does it work? Because the authentication is actually prompted in the backend and doesn't have to go to manually add this or even see it. With this, the entire installation is hands-free where an administrator can push off an installation and see there for a while the product will be perfectly working and installed. That's what Jamf is useful for our endpoint security for Mac. Chris, this topic is exclusion for Mac. First question comes to mind, why do I require exclusions? Let me explain how exclusion says certain applications keep constantly writing data to this it should create performance issues. It's necessary for us to create an exclusion to streamline the performance of the application and the system. What, how do we know what kind of exclusions can be placed? Certain times, uh, application vendors provide the exclusion path. Exclusion can be placed based on the file path, file type, and the process from the trusted application sources. Endpoint security for Mac has two wildcard support. One is single hash trick and the question mark, single hash trick represents any number of folders and any number of characters in a string. Question mark replaces a single character in a file name, directory name, or a file type. Let's look at the examples. How can the asterisk and question mark used in the exclusion part? If an admin wants the user profiles to be excluded from scanning, you can use root users asterisk and the path required for exclusion. We know multiple applications write log files to the system which can be excluded using root asterisk dot log and combine multiple extensions with a single extension rule and place them. We know plist files present on the Mac OS which are of different type info plist, version plist and to exclude all the plists from the application folder we can use the below syntax. We know Java applications write jar war files to the system which can be excluded using the question mark. Asterisk question mark AR is the file type which can exclude all the jar var files from the system from the private way temp location. Profile based scanning in time security for Mac contains three profiles standard, high, low. It also helps in balancing the system for security and the resource utilization. 
is an alternate for the on axis scanning. Standard process. All these processes on the system are scanned under the standard process until it is specified as low risk or high risk. What are high risk processes? A process which has to be continuously monitored from the system, the critical applications, which has to be continuously under scanning can be placed under the high risk profile. An example for high risk profile can be a browser process which has to be scanned continuously and set the scan settings to read and write. Low profile risk, which helps in configuring for a, a process which is trusted from trusted sources or a custom built application process and set the scan to do not scan will improve the performance of the system. Overall, the exclusion helps in improving the performance and balancing the security of the system. We'll see more on the demo. Let us look at how the exclusions can be placed on the Mac machine and validate them. Exclusions can be placed locally from the Mac machine or from the EPO server. Let us look uh, at ENSM is already installed on the machine. Let us look what components are present on the machine. What components are present on the machine? Click in the about box. You will be able to see the contents of the endpoint security threat prevention is installed on the machine. And click on the console, you will be able to see the status of the threat prevention. Threat prevention is enabled here. Like click on the preferences. This is where we will be able to set the exclusions manually. Click on it on access scan. Click on the configure settings. We have three profile based scanning available for an access scan. One is standard profile, high risk and low risk profiles. Under standard profile, all the processes are being scanned under a standard profile. When you place the process under high risk or low risk profile, that is where you can set the exclusion for that particular process. OK, now let us look at the low risk process. Low risk process, we have an option do not scan so that Whatever is placed under the low risk will not be scanned for that particular process. And let us see how to add an exclusion. Just click on the plus symbol, select the binary which is located on the mission so that the process is under low risk profile. Let us uh, go back to the EPO and see how we configure them. This is the mission which we have selected there. Let us select the mission, click on action, click on the agent. Click on edit policy and single mission. Uh, here we are trying to change the unaccess scan policy. Let me click on unaccess scan my default policy. Like if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, you will be able to see the exclusions part. This is where we'll add the exclusions. One is uh, we have two types of uh, exclusions can be added. One is file type and file path. The file path can also be included with wild characters, question mark and star. Let me add a exclusion for the wild path with wild characters. This is where I'm adding a star user star desktop test one as a folder of exclusion, which I'm also including the subfolder so that any files written under the test will be excluded from scanning and I'm saving the file. Now next, let me click on the add and show you how to add a file type. I'm selecting the file type and clicking the question mark is supported there. I'm clicking the question mark and setting AR as the file type. Any files, I'm saving the file. Any files written with a file type as a jar, RAR, can be excluded from scanning. This is the option where it can be override the exclusions configured on the client. This option will uh, overwrite any locally configured exclusions. Let us move back uh, on the top to the process exclusion. For process exclusion, configure different settings based on the profile and low risk profiles. Like now I'm selecting a low risk profile, adding a low risk profile, process under low risk profile. And selecting a low risk and saving the file. And make sure under the low risk, the option is selected as do not scan when reading or writing from the disk and save the policy. Now all the settings, whatever I want to configure has been configured. I'm clicking on save the policy now. Once I click the save the policy, now let us give agent wake up call so that the policy is being pushed to the Mac mission.
Let us move back to the Mac machine. Let us click on the preferences to see. Before that, let us click on the agent uh, wake up call so that the policies come down to the mission. This is where we have an option called send and review, receive properties, send events, check for new policies. We will click on check new policies and see how the policies are coming down to the client mission. Okay, we'll wait for the policies to enforce from the EPO. Now let us click on the preferences and see as you can see under the process we have a low risk profile configured for one of the process. Now let us click on the configure settings and check for the file based exclusion what we have added there. We are able to see the file type and file path exclusion which we added. Now let us validate how the exclusion works. Uh, let me open up a terminal for that. Let me open a terminal and write an installation check to the folder. The desktop is not excluded from scanning. So we are able to see the detection is happening and now let us see what is the exclusion path we have mentioned. I have mentioned user star desktop uh, test one as a folder and subfolders to be included. Now let me write the same detection to the test one folder under desktop. Let me modify this and add test one the uh, folder. And validate this and uh, let me close this so that we see that detection is not happening. Here we can conclude that the exclusion has been honored. That means like the file has been returned to the desk, uh, test one folder so that you can see the file on this. This is how the file path with file character support is excluded. Let us now test the file type now. Let us do the same thing with the desktop. Let me test the dot jar file. So even as a file type, it is again excluded. So we are able to see test dot jar file on the desktop. So because as a file type is excluded, we are also honoring the exclusions here. Now let us go back to the process exclusion. Let us uh, select the process, uh, one of the process, text editor as a process. Let me write to the ten content. Let me enable the debug logging. Click on the logging and enable the debug logging. And save this text file. I'm saving it as test ps dot rtf file. Save the file. Now I'll grab the logging to see that we are capture what uh, exclusion works, the process level exclusion. Here you can see that the files uh, process which is responsible is under put under low risk is been excluded from scanning. You can see cache not hit for this file. These are file ps test ps is rtf the file which you don't and you can also see that the reason for exclusion is the reason which is not getting scanned. This is how we validate. Now let me show you if I write an installation check to the same file how the detection happens. So that any other process writing will also be detected.
you can see the detection has occurred. That means like uh, if any other process tries to write to the file, it will be detected until the own same process text edit process writes to the file. If you can see the process name responsible for the bash process was responsible for writing this detection. OK, this is how the detection works. This is uh, mainly the under low risk profile. You'll be able to see these exclusions. This is how the exclusion works and we have learned how to add a file path, file type, and process under low risk profile based exclusions. Moving to the firewall debug logging and analysis. The live stream log or the debug enable stateful firewall.log would record all the traffic details, further allowing us to understand the flow of the traffic along with the action taken on each traffic. Now, how do we capture the stream logging? Would be simple. Enabling the debug logging and confirming the same, reflecting on the client console, using the command marked in the green, which would initiate the live logging. Let's once again enable and check this in practical. Now, I have a Mac machine here, which only has the firewall module installed. Let me quickly walk you through enabling the debug logging and also activating this live stream. So, first of all, console and you can only see firewall enabled here. That's the only module that I've installed from my perspective and this is also a standalone which does not have any specific rules as such from filtering from APO. Now under logging, I would enable the firewall logging. Right after that, lock it up, close it up. Now the command that I just used here would be already captured here which I would be pasting up and also performing the capture. There are two ways to do it. Either I can go with the live stream logging while I could see is just press enter and it will start capturing every detail on the traffic or another simplest way is to pipe it to a file based on the location that you want to save it. Now here I am on desktop. Let me just save it as log.txt and activities related to that will start capturing here. And on the right side, you can see the log.txt is already loading up. Now, what is it doing on the back end? Now, this is a machine which is connected at the network level, and you will see a lot of traffic port pasting out with this, a lot of activities from the traffic, and a lot of parsing on the traffic rules is all there. Now, I've just enabled it for a few seconds, and the moment I see it, the log.txt is completely loaded with huge traffic details that you can see here, which is all at the debug level. What does it do? This will capture a traffic flowing from the first rule of the firewall module to the last rule of the firewall module. As we all know, the firewall module is basing on the rules with the water flow model, and it will go through each and every rule here and understanding whether the traffic match that rule or not. You can see a lot of activities here which is saying McAfee allow boot up evaluated to uh, false. McAfee allow DNS evaluated to be false. Going all these here, this is writing up a huge entry with the robust logging by default it is. Now with this is where you can filter with specific analysis methodology that can be used to understand the traffic details. Now without wasting much time here, I'll take you to the presentation again where I can show you certain examples of logging that I've dedicatedly captured for our session today. We understood how to capture the live stream logging. Now let's analyze the log capture with a few examples. I have an example where the client machine is failing to communicate or bind to the Active Directory server due to firewall. How to start the analysis? The keyword to be used is evaluate NW policy where the details of every traffic trigger start to capture. Let's understand the traffic details from the log. It starts by showing the local endpoint and the remote endpoint IP addresses I have mastered due to the obvious reasons. Then the application triggers the traffic, which is open directory D in this case. Ports used in the traffic, both local and remote. And protocol used, which is one, defines TCP, where two for UDP and three for ICMP traffic. Finally, the direction, which is one, where one is considered to be an inbound traffic and two as outbound traffic. Now to the block action seen here. The rule that blocked the traffic here is a default block rule, which is a hard-coded rule in the firewall module, 
and is hidden to modify or ignore. Why is this a hard-coded rule? Imagine a traffic that has no matching McAfee or user-defined rules. Can we allow this sort of a traffic? Definitely not. Hence, when the traffic does not match any of the McAfee or user-defined firewall rules, the default block rule will automatically trigger and block the traffic once for all. The second example here, where the traffic is blocked due to the McAfee defined rule. Once again, with the same keyword, we will be able to see the traffic initiated along with the traffic details. The direction in this example is two, which is outbound. Now to the block action again. The outbound traffic here is blocked by the McAfee defined rule called block untrusted net by your session over TCP. And as we can see, it also documents the rule trigger along with the group called NetBIOS and also with the final reaction as block. Now for the third example, let me explain the allow all rule. This rule is specifically used at times to understand the role of the firewall rules in a given scenario, where placing the allow all rule, firewall would blindly allow the traffic, which indeed would confirm the issue is due to the firewall rules present. The traffic captured would remain the same as previous, whereas in this case, the rule name would just be the custom name of the rule and the action taken. We shall further move on to Web Control for Mac. Web Control for Mac. We know nowadays there are more security threats coming to the browsers. Hence, we have in front security for Mac Web Control. This gives additional security for restricting the web-based threats coming to the browsers. Web Control provides support for Google Chrome and Safari browsers. Let's understand how the reputation of a site works. When a user accesses the site, the URL of the site reaches sae.udi.website.com to fetch the reputation of the site. Based on the results fetched, it displays the safety category of the site with color code. Each color button indicates the safety category of the site. Green site is safe, you can access them. Hello. Suspicious may pose a security risk, you must access them with caution. Red cell contains a potential risk, you must access the site extreme. A default is blocked by the site administrator. Gray indicates there is no rating available for site that allows the site to be available. Orange indicates the site security details is not available to display the rating. Black indicates the phishing sites are blocked by the admin. Blue indicates it's a internal IP or a private range of IP. Silver indicates it's the control is in disabled state. White indicates it is allowed by the admin based on the rule set to allow and block rule. Content category and block allow list. There are different policies that are available for web control, such as category blocking, allow block list. Make a provides an online tool called trusted source.org that enables to check if a site is categorized. If the user recognizes the categorization is not accurate, they can write a dispute, log into the portal, and submit the URL with relevant categorization needs. Few content categories are enabled by default. Malicious sites, block sites, phishing sites. Block and allow list configuration overrides the web category block and rating action of a site. Use this option to access a business-specific site and block unwanted sites. Example, if a Google chart is blocked by content category, admin can place a chart under the allow list. User will be able to play a access the Google chart. Please refer the KB article 72563 for testing the security setting actions. See more on the demo. Let us look how the web control for Mac gives an extra protection using the browsers. We have a Mac machine where ENSM web control is already installed on the machine. Let us look what components are present on the machine. Let me click on emulate, click on the about box. It will give me the web control version installed on this machine. Let me click on the emulate and click on the console to know what is the status of web control. Web control sh status shows enabled. Let me click on the preferences to know what settings have been configured. And this is also the place where I can check the configuration, what uh, sites are blocked, what is the configuration set. This also can be set from the EPO as well as on the local mission. Let me go back to the EPO mission and see set the policies and validate them. Let me go back to the EPO server.
Let me select the web control mission. Select the mission, click on action. Click on agent, edit a policy on a single mission. Now we can select the web control as a policy. And under web control, we see many policies like block, allow list, browser control, content action, enforcement messages and options. Not all the policies are applicable to Mac. There's a limitation on that. Let us concentrate on block and allow list content action. Let me click on block allow list my default. Add a site which is used to block the site. I'm using the option block. I'm blocking the yahoo.com. Save the file and save the policy. Now click on the content action. Select the alcohol as the content action and save the file. Now, what are the configurations I plan to change has been updated? Let me give a agent wake up call so that the policies are deployed onto the client mission. Let me select the mission and give an agent wake up call. Let me go back to the Mac mission and give an agent wake up call so that the policies are enforced from EPO to the client mission. Close this agent window. Let me click on the preferences. We can see under the block allow list yahoo.com as present. Even the yeah, alcohol site has been selected, but it's due to space constraint, it has not been displayed on the UI framework. And you can see what actions were set for block, yellow for warning, unrated allow, verified, unverified allow. Let us uh, look how the browser extensions have been checked in. Extensions has to be manually given a consent for the both Safari and Chrome browsers. Let us look at the Safari browser and what kind of uh, extensions has to be checked in manually. Let's click on the Safari. Let's click on the menu let Safari preferences. Once you click on the Safari preferences, you will be seeing make a endpoint uh, web control 1078 installed. Let us check in the extension. Close this browser. As soon as the extension is checked in, you will on the left hand side, you will see the McAfee icon. Close the browser. Let us open the Chrome now. Let us open a Chrome browser. Let us click on the menu led Chrome and select the preferences. Click on the extensions. Click on the McAfee and Security Web Control extension. Make sure that it is checked in and enabled. Like as you can see, the McAfee icon is present on the right hand side of the address bar. Close the Chrome. Now let us verify the sites what we have blocked and based on the content category, what uh, actions are going to be taken place. As you have blocked yahoo.com as a block rule, let me open yahoo.com. You can see the site is blocked as a network administrator. We have manually blocked the yahoo.com. Let us check the same way for the content category. We have blocked alcohol site. Let us uh, type in the Hennigan site and see how it. Uh, You can see it is blocked based on the content category and even if the site is uh, green button, still it has been blocked. Let us open an internal site to test the uh, citing uh, ratings. Let us open up a red site. Once you open up a red site, by default it is blocked. You can see the action as well as the red a cafe icon present on the right hand side of the address bar. The same way, let us open the yellow site. You can see the 
color code yellow is present on the icon and you also see it allows us to continue the browsing. It's a conscious site which has to be carefully handled. Let us open a gray site. Which is allowing us without verification is allowing us to go. Let us look at the green site apple.com. is allowing us to browse this site. Let us go with an internal site. Where the color code should be shown as blue. You can see the color code as blue so that we are able to identify based on the color codes what kind of sites we are opening and what kind of ratings we are getting for individual sites now we have browsed so many sites we have categorized different sites based on the requirement based on the content category everything now let us give an agent wake up call so that the events generated for this particular block events will be sent to the epo so that the network administrator can take necessary action and implement throughout the organization or see what kind of blocks has been accessed by the user or what kind of uh, warning sites has been used by the user let us give an agent wake up call and see it on the epo so that the policy uh, like the events are present on the mission let us give a collect and send properties send the events check for new policies enforce the policies let's close let's move to the epo server now let us click on the mission and click on the threat events. Once you see the threat events, you are seeing one at 600 as a threat event ID. And if you click on that, if you expand, it will show us what was the event generated for. The event was generated for a block site. Action was taken block and it was a red site. The action uh, rating was red site. This is how the uh, uh, administrator can know what kind of uh, browse sites have been browsed by the user or the Mac end, and based on that, you can implement throughout the organization, which will help the enhance the security on Mac. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Atash and Guru Raj. As a reminder, Trellix Education Services offers exceptional training to go along with our award winning product. If you would like to learn more, please visit the website listed on the screen to see all of our offerings. Let's get our QA session started. I see we have several questions, but it's not too late to add your question. Please type it in the Q&A window to submit. Additionally, take a moment to fill out the survey. Your feedback and suggestions are always appreciated. Let's say a machine is not enrolled in JAMS and ENS or MAC is pushed from EPO. Will this result in an installation failure or will the user get a prompt to add the pass manually? I don't think that's nice. The installation should not be impacted. The end user just have to authenticate so that the module starts protecting it. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Does Trellix McAfee support ENS installations and usage of custom scripts from Jam? Let me take this. We recommend our customers to use EPO or the standalone method when deploying endpoint security for Mac in any environment, uh, any related articles would provide it for information purpose only. I hope that answers. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, regarding exclusions, does the on access uh, exclusions apply to the on demand scan uh, as well? Let me take this name. On demand scan has two types of scanning options. One is policy based scanning. In that we have full scan and quick scan where we can set the exclusions on the ODS scan policy and a custom scan while creating the task itself we have an option to put exclusions during the creation of the task and assign it to the mission. Uh, the two different policies on active scan policy is different, on demand scan policy is different. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Can we use uh, wildcards when adding processes to the exclusion list? Let me take it's a good question. No, unfortunately, the wildcard is 
not supported for the process case scanning, the full path of the binary must be placed in the exclusion path. As shown in the presentation, wildcard can be placed for the file path and file type exclusions only. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, regarding uh, the firewall logging, why do we need to uh, have the system extension loaded? Let me take this. Uh, with the architectural change from Apple, system extension works in the background to uh, extend the functionality in the user space. This would allow every Mac or Felix component to integrate closely with the Mac OS and start protecting the machine. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. What's the use of stream logging? I take this again. Uh, log stream is a unified logging, uh, which is introduced by Apple, uh, capturing the stream activities like log data, face messages from the system, or from a given process. And this would be the firewall process of McAfee, which would help you in stream logging. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Does web control support search annotations? Let me pick up this. Yes, web control support the search annotations, which are from the Google search engine only. It displays the safety rating icon next to the each site that is listed by the search engine. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Where do we find the web control login? A good question. Let me answer this. Like web control monitors and regulates the browser activity and log events are generated, not logging. Log events are generated, which are stored in the agent DB folder, which are configured for block and allow list red and yellow sites, which when a user visits a site which is uh, blocked, events will be generated 8600, and those events will be visible at the threat events in the mission of the EPO server. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Is web control for Mac supported on uh, Envision EPO? Let me take this. Yes, web control is supported to Envision and managed to the Mac policies. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. I think that's all the time that we're, we have for today's session. I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar and a big thank you to our speakers, Hitachi Guru. As a reminder, a link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all participants. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about future session topics, please email me at nick.barnes at trellix.com. This concludes today's webinar. Stay safe, everyone.